From 1950 on, the city of Seattle echoed with a snarling, thundering sound of unlimited hydroplane. Powerful boats like the Miss Thriftway. Slow motion. Hawaii Kai and the Bardal roared around Lake Washington, belching smoke and fire. These classic race boats were powered by vintage World War II aircraft engines. Mighty Rolls-Royce Merlins and Allisons. The distinctive roar of these old boats caused people around the city to call them Thunderboats. Now Jim Clapp was a man of tremendous vision. When he looked at the contemporary race boats, he saw a paradox between the sleek modern hulls and their ancient outdated power plants. He knew that something could change. Jim had already successfully introduced turbine engines into the yachting world with his extraordinary Nothing More, the world's first gas turbine luxury yacht. It was only natural that he would see gas turbines as the obvious replacement for the heavy, bulky piston engines that dominated hydroplane racing. Jim was not the first person to try and run a turbine in an Unlimited. At least three other teams had tried in the late 60s and early 70s, but all three had failed. Jim was aware of these failures when he set out, but that didn't bother him. He was confident that with a careful professional development plan, all obstacles could be overcome. Now the first obstacle came in convincing the Unlimited Racing Commission, the sport's governing body, to amend their rules to allow a turbine boat to compete. Jim was so successful in making a case that he was given an unprecedented three-year waiver. Jim assembled one of the greatest brain trusts in the history of boat racing. Ron Jones designed and built the futuristic new hull. Leif Borgerson was selected to drive. Chuck Lifer became project manager. Jim Larson was the aerodynamicist. The gearbox was designed by John Maddox. Bill Penland, Dwight Thorne, and Greg Smith and countless others played important roles in bringing the dream alive. In a shop behind the old King TV building, Clapp, Lyford, and the crew began to assemble that U95. Unable to find one motor that would provide the necessary horsepower, the U95 was outfitted with two Lycoming T53s running through a T gearbox to a single propeller. Other state-of-the-art improvements included a unique three-part vertical stabilizer, two-way radio communications, and an onboard videotape recorder to record gauge positions on a second control panel mounted under the nose cowl. Early in the summer of 1973, the U-95 was taken outside to be trailer fired for the first time. An excited but skeptical group of fans gathered to witness that historic moment. Yeah, you got to cut off, right? You ready? EGT is right here. Right, okay. Ready, crank? Clear! Got igniter. Few realized it, but from the moment the U-95 starters first appeared to wind and the mighty turbines began to spool, the fate of the old piston engines was sealed. Seattle Seafair race fell in the first week of August and the U-95 wasn't quite ready, but that didn't stop Jim, Chuck, and the crew from making a dramatic entrance. The boat was cosmetically so gorgeous, taken to Stan Sayers' pits for its official christening. Excited fans lined the roads around Stan Sayers' pits just to get the first view of the revolutionary new boat. All of the major powers in the sport gathered to look at this unique craft. Most dismissed it as an interesting diversion. 
few realized that they were looking at the new shape of the future. On Saturday afternoon, the 4th of August, the U-95 was publicly trailer fired in the pits. It should have been a routine event. It wasn't. Flames shot out the back of the engine as worried crew members scrambled to put out the blaze. Luckily, damage was slight. The next morning, as the piston boats prepared for the race, the U-95 was lowered into the water for her christening. Jim's wife, Pamela Clapp, broke a bottle of champagne across the bow, and a new era in boat racing began. Five weeks later, on September the 12th, the U-95 made her maiden run. Thousands of fans crowded onto the finger piers at Stan Sayers Pits when the beautiful red and white boat pulled out onto the lake. The startled fans remarked how quiet the boat was. And for the first time, the spectators could actually hear the sound of the propeller and the sound of the giant rooster tail as it fell back into the lake. The U-95 performed beautifully and the crew looked forward to a 1974 season with anticipation. Unfortunately, James Clapp would not live to see the coming season, would not live to see that dream come to reality. He died in February, but his dream didn't die, and Pam committed herself to continuing the project. The U-95's first race was in Miami. The team earned a fifth place trophy. As the season progressed, the crew began to come together and function as a single unit. Each time out, the boat ran better and better. In Washington, D.C., they moved up to third place. In Owensboro, Kentucky, they got a second and set both qualifying records and a heat record. The team seemed poised on the edge of greatness. You know, we have worked hard and uh, my people that have been with me on this boat from the start, uh, the owner Jim Clapp and his wife Pam and Chuck Lyford and uh, all the people that have really put the time, the effort and the knowledge into this boat. I really feel right now that the boat is really three quarters of the way there, if not further, uh, in many areas, but I'll never be happy unless we win. It's that type of thing. You keep making changes and uh, different ideas pop up and you always want the boat to handle a little bit better, of course, each time and run a little bit faster. I really think that uh, we should be proud of our efforts so far and, and our positioning third place nationally so far. The World Championship in Tri-Cities looked like it might be that breakthrough race. They qualified second fastest, just a mile an hour behind the national champion pay impact. Leif Borgerson and the U95 took a second in their first heat, but in the second heat they hooked up with a pay impact for a duel that turned out to be classic. Running side by side with the U95 on the outside, the U95 won with what would prove to be the fastest speed of the day. A stage was set for the final heat showdown that would pit the best of the piston boats against the upstart turbine. In the run to the starting line for the final heat, Bill Muncy and his Atlas van lines, and he was supposed to be the trailer boat, somehow collided with the U-95 in the turn, crushing the vertical stabilizer, and with its tail feathers trimmed, the U-95 wasn't much of a threat. She still finished fourth for the day. Damage to the boat was extensive. Muncy protested his innocence, but the paint scratches on the bow of the Atlas proved otherwise. That was tail paint from the U-95. The next week was the Gold Cup in Seattle. The U-95 couldn't be repaired in time, so she arrived in Seattle with lead plates bolted over the transom to replace the missing weight of the tail. In a good-natured response to Muncie's aggressive driving during the accident, a bright red shark's mouth was painted on the boat's sponsons. Clearly, the boat did not perform well without her wing. She qualified seventh fastest, a full seven and a half miles an hour behind the leader. In her first heat, the U-95 blew an engine. Tommy can really put his foot in this. His dad, Al, was a great hydroplane driver in the 30s and 40s. The Budweiser is dead in the water. U-95 is going down also. Outside the uh, south turn, the exit pin, the U-95 is going down also. So we've got two boats dead in the water. There goes a the flare out into the water right in front of the official barge. 
Stand by to see what we've got there. The helicopter swooping down upon the uh, backstretch at the exit pin of the the pay and pack uh, south turn. Off, as you see in the screen, but we've got flares flying all over the place, way down in the south turn. The U-95 is sinking. We're reported. There it is. The U-95. Look at that. It's sinking. The U-95, the turbine-powered boat. Jim Claps conceived idea carried on by his widow Pam and driven by Lake Borgeson in the water. So this heat is now being flagged off. For many Hydro fans, their last view of the U-95 was that shark's razor-edged teeth biting into the air above Lake Washington as the beautiful U-95 slipped beneath the surface and settled 200 feet down on the bottom of the lake near Sand Point. 25 years have passed since Jim Clapp launched his turbine revolution. With the passing of time, perspectives change. When the U-95 went down in 1974, few people would have considered Clapp's turbine a tremendous success. But when you look at all the ideas that were pioneered by the U-95 and now have been assimilated by the sport, it's truly mind-boggling. It is so clear that Jim Clapp's influence lives on in the sport that he loves so much with the boat, that turbine-powered U-95, whose memory is still alive and well today.